Oui, je suis euh, belge, euh, mais je suis flamand, alors euh, français, oui. <laughs> um, it would just be embarrassing. Um, <laughs> so, right, first of all, thank you very much, Jeff, for, for the invitation, and, and thanks very much, everybody, for coming here and the school for hosting. Um, yes, yeah, so what am I going to talk about? That's a very good question. Um, I've done lots of very different things. I'm, I'm, I usually don't fit very well in a particular bucket. I'm a web developer or backend or machine learning thing. I, I like to do different things. And also, I'm, I'm very, I care very much about the applications I work on. I really like that connection with the ultimate, with, with the end application. It's more interesting to me than actually technology in itself. Though technology is interesting as well, of course. Um, but also, so this talk will kind of talk about three things. I'm involved in, um, which I find interesting. It's going to be an application level talk. I'm not going to go very deep down into technical bits. I'm going to give more of an overview because um, there's really there's there's at least three full separate talks in this, and I can't cover everything. But I just think these are things that I find interesting and I like talking about. So, and I have an audience. You can't really go anywhere. Well, you could. But. So, um, yeah. So that kind of sets the scene a bit. Right, so beyond ad clicks. Now, I called it this because uh, this goes, goes back a few years. I had a, a friend of mine who was working very much on ad click prediction. So you have a web page, it serves some ads, who's going to click where and which ads should I serve, et cetera. And you know, he made a lot of money. He was a good job. Um, but he, he always used to complain that he didn't really, you know, wasn't really that socially rewarding to him to be looking at you know, which ad of women's underwear sh you know, should you serve up to, to people. Um, and, uh, you know, and me, me too, I, I'm not particularly interested in those kind of things. So, you know, I always try to find those other more interesting applications. Not to say there's no, nothing technically interested in the other side. Anyway, so beyond that click. So, yeah, first of all, me, I've given a bit of background, but there's actually three things that I kind of in interest me. So the bottom, you know, I'm, I'm a computer science person at heart. That was my original education. I like code. I like, I spend a lot of time in an editor. Um, and then that's kind of my background. However, I've also always been interested in more the, the physical side of things. So if I like tangible things. So I was always drawn to big machines and, and the engineering side of, of things, which is kind of illustrated by top left. So I did a lot of work in aerospace. I've always had a, you know, an affinity for, for underwater robotics and, and drones and things. Um, so I really like that kind of engineering aspect. I also, you know, on the far right, I've always been very interested in kind of the interface between technology on one hand and the humanitarian conservation side on the other hand. So I spend, uh, I spend a lot of my time volunteering for various, various organizations. I did a lot of work for the World Bank. I've done various projects in, in this kind of space. Development, ICT for D, that kind of area. And ideally, my perfect job is I can kind of mix elements of all three. Um, and then, you know, disaster robotics and, and there's certain things that fit in those categories. But that's kind of my space, what I really like. Um, and I know Jeff from, from London. Um, I, there I, I co-organized the, the London Algorithms Meetup and the Machine Learning Meetup. And if, everybody, if anybody's ever in London, I would suggest you do come along. It's a great community. Um, and we've got some really interesting um, companies and, and speakers. Anyway, right. Oh, yeah, and this is kind of my own pet project, which I'm just struggling to find time for, but I will get to eventually, is I really, really, really want to build an autonomous litter robot. And I already have, you know, some ideas, and I've got a chassis, and I've got, you know, some stuff going. But still a lot of work to do, but that's kind of on the side, which I, I really like to spend time on. Anyway, oh, and my day job is I, you know, about six months ago, I joined Oxbotica. We, you know, we are a, a mobile autonomy company. We work on self-driving self vehicles. Um, though I have to stress that this talk is with my own personal hat on. I'm not here representing Oxbotica. I'll just mention kind of the work we do. But, you know, that's a... Separate hat. So right, and so three themes. Um, I'll start off with ground penetrating radar and landmines. Who knows anything here about ground penetrating radar, GPR? Anybody? No. Okay, fine. Who knows what landmines are? Who's done some work with landmines or humanitarian organizations or? No. Okay, cool. So I'm going to talk about this, but first of all, I have to stress. You know, I have to give you know massive credits here, mostly to Patrick Carson from UCL, who we did. University College London, who did a lot of work, this work with, and who really did all a lot of the, you know, the heavy lifting here. And also Max Jacobs at Skycap. So first, OK, GPR, ground penetrating radar. So a radar that penetrates into the ground. And in terms of what you need to visualize, is this is the kind of hardware. So traditionally, you have some kind of cart, and you've got 
you know, a big metal box that's typically antennas. Uh, you've got a sending and receiving antenna, and then you've got a, a control panel at the top which just does, does some signal processing. And, you know, typically it's a cart you kind of push forward like a pram, but, you know, in some cases you drag it behind you. And so the antenna, oh, it's telling me I should take an RSI break. Sorry, I'm going to turn this off. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't get, you know, good posture and all the rest of it. So let's quit that. It's interesting. I thought it would go away. Okay. Yay. Right. Um, so how does this work? So in this case, you drag something behind me. You have a transmitter antenna, which sends a signal, uh, an e-impulse into the ground, a particular frequency that will travel through the ground and it'll hit, it'll hit an object which will reflect back and you can look at the, the pattern of the, the signal you, ref, you get reflected back and you can look at that pack pattern and do some interesting signal processing to figure out what's actually underneath in the ground. That's a kind of very high level view. You know, that's the, the kind of intuition behind it. Um, and then the idea is you get different patterns will give you, you know, insight about what objects are underneath. Um, so as an example, this is traditionally used very much in, um, in the utilities industry. So if you're looking for pipes um, or, or cables or such are buried in the ground because um, you're going to, you know, a, you're going to build a new intersection or a new bridge or whatever, you need to dig up a road. You want to make sure you don't dig through the cables or, or break any pipes. So we use GPR to do a survey and that will then tell you where the cables are and then you can, you know, work around them. Um, and typically the responses you get for these kind of things are these kind of parabolic shapes. And the reason it's a parabola is because actually you're moving over the ground and if you look at the travel distances the pulse takes, you, you can work out it actually is supposed to be a parabola, but that's, that's less important. But the idea is, you know, different objects will have different parabolas and different, different shapes and different intensities and that, you, that way you can work out what's underneath. Um, so, you know, it's obvious that this is, I had a lot of disagreement with salespeople who kind of sell GPR, oh, it's like a photograph from underneath your feet. You know, this doesn't really look like a photograph at all. But, you know, it, as a sales pitch, it, it works well, but many people come away disillusioned. <laughs> right, so, you know, it's, it's not magic. Um, it's, it's a very general tool, GPR. You can use it in lots of uh, circumstances, but it's not magic. It just can't magically see into the ground. Um, a lot depends on the type of soil you're dealing with. Um, more particularly, the RDP value of the soil. So every soil has a, should we say, a kind of conductivity, how well um, your signal can penetrate through it. And it ranges from somewhere between, I think it's one for air, so then, you know, there's essentially no, no resistance for the signal to travel through the air, to, you know, like 81 for water. So trying to get an EM signal through water <laughs> is extremely difficult, so you're not going to get much penetration. So, and of course, the soil you deal with, you have lots of different soils, there are lots of different characteristics, so depending on what type of soil you're dealing with, if it's very wet, you're not going to get much penetration. If it's very dry, it's like a desert condition, um, then you will get high penetration. So there's a, there's a, there's a lot of variation there. Um, and also you've got the conductivity of the soil, so some soils, um, they're very conductive, like clays, for example, and they attenuate the signal, or you've got um, even magnetic soils in some cases. Um, or, or salinity, for example, saline, saline soils are a big issue because they weaken the signal. And what does that mean? Is that your, your signal won't penetrate very deep, so you won't be able to see much other than maybe, you know, the first 10, 20 centimeters or whatever, depending on what system you're using. But anyway, so it, it's, it's just physics. There's nothing magical about it. Um, and so you're sending out a pulse with a particular frequency, and then depending what frequency you use, you can either penetrate deeper or less, or, or less deep. So if you use a very high frequency, so you know, you're talking about 900 megahertz, for example, you can only penetrate on the order, again, it all depends on many factors, but let's say roughly a meter. And this is with the antenna stuck on the ground, pretty much. So you can penetrate about a meter. So that's not very deep. But you're using a very high frequency, so a short wavelength, uh, so that means you've got quite high resolution. You can pick out small things. On the other hand, if you go for a lower wavelength, say 100 megahertz, you can penetrate much deeper, 10, 20 meters, but you know, much longer wavelength, you're not going to get much resolution. That's a trade-off. It's fairly intuitive. Um, and so you get these, these scans, these radar grams. So this is a kind of vertical slice into the ground, and you see the parabolas. And then some interesting post-processing you can do is you can take horizontal slices and you can stitch them together in a cube. And then you can look at the cube from the top down as a bird's eye view. And then you can also look at particular features. For example, if you're doing an archaeological survey this way, you can, by building that kind of representation, you can, you can kind of see the, the foundations of an old building, for example, or, or, or a tomb or, or such. Um, 
And once you, you, know, you have the 3D cube, you can then start doing isosurface extraction and, and try to extract objects um, that you might be interested in. Maybe it's, maybe it's an, an old burial site or, or some pipes or, or whatever. Um, again, the details are not really important, but it's just to get an intuition that you're pushing this thing over the ground, you get these, these parabolic shapes, and then you can layer all these scans next to each other into a, a cube, and then you can start extracting features from that cube and to see what's underneath. underneath. So, general purpose tool, but what we're particularly interested in is landmines. So, can you detect landmines? So, GPR has been used for landmines for quite a long time. Um, GPR itself has been around for a long time. Um, but actually, processing the data is very, very tricky and requires a lot of human expertise. Um, but the idea, that, you know, again, the intuition is, is fairly obvious that you have different types of landmines and they give different types of returns. And can you, by looking at the returns, figure out, first of all, is there a landmine, yes or no? And maybe you can even figure out what type of landmine. Um, now, and just I should note, here I'm focusing on humanitarian demining, which is very different from demining in a military context. So I'm, I'm looking here at humanitarian demining. So mines which have been around for a long time or laid down in, 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 in time to conflict and now need to be removed now the conflict has been resolved. And this is, uh, as you can obviously see, a very delicate and very dangerous process. It typically involves a lot of time sitting on knees and very carefully with a stick probing to figure out where the mine is. It's extremely slow, it's extremely dangerous and time consuming. And there's various sensors people have developed, but typically, you know, a lot of it is just on your knees and, and poking. Um, but so the idea was, okay, could we, could we do something, could we improve this process somehow? We're not going to solve the fundamental problem, but could we kind of speed, speed things up a bit? And so that was the idea of using an airborne GPR. So traditionally, all GPR is cart on the ground. So the antenna is literally, you know, is about, you know, either dragged on the ground directly or there's, you know, it's literally like a centimeter between the antenna and the ground. But you can imagine walking a cart over a minefield is not a good idea, right? So <laughs> the idea, can we do it from the air? But that raises all kinds of problems on, on many fronts. Um, so, okay, so, you know, the terrain is obviously problematic. If it's not a nice flat terrain, you're going to have a hard time with your cart. Um, and obviously, if you step on something, it's going to explode, right? Um, but, okay, but the problem is, as soon as you take the antenna and you pull it off the ground, uh, you, you have this massive problem where, yes, you're sending out a pulse, but 80% of the energy of the pulse is going to hit the surface of the ground and bounce right back. And so you get almost nothing penetration. Everything just reflects back, pretty much. Um, so suddenly your signal to noise is just horrendous. And of course you lose penetration depth. There's just no way around it. You have to penetrate that top layer, which is problematic. So there's, uh, and currently, there's actually, there's not much that exists um, at the types of wavelengths you need to be able to accurately detect landmines. And then, you know, a landmine, we're talking anything from an anti-personnel mine, which is the size of a fist, let's say, to a large anti-tank mine. And obviously, the big anti-tank mines are going to be easier. But still, right, so we partnered with a, a radar company who did a lot of work and build a, a bespoke um, system, which, to my knowledge, is currently still unique in the world, which ca captures, packs the whole thing down to something the size of a shoebox and weigh, weighs about um, just under a kilo. Um, and that way, okay, we have something small and light enough and still, you know, efficient enough to, to actually get some penetration for the use case we care about. And so the first prototype we, 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 we had was essentially that you strap it to a multi-copter and you can start doing surveys. Um, now, of course, the catch is you have to fly about a meter off the ground. If you fly a meter and a half off the ground, you're not going to see anything, you know. Um, if you fly too low, you, well, you're not going to fly properly because you get ground effect or you bump into things. And so there's all kinds of issues there. And then there's all kinds of issues around how do you position accurately? Because if, you know, if there's a line mine there, you want to make sure it's there and not, not 30 centimeters to the left. So you need to know very accurately where the drone is. And that also brings a whole, kinds of, whole bunch of questions. How do you do that? Again, whole separate talk. But anyway, okay, well, you know, we have something we can start flying around. Sure. Uh, how much are they charging per hour? <laughs> but yes, it would be awesome. <laughs> not sure about you know you you venting the, you sending these rockets onto a minefield. I'm not sure what that does, but you know maybe that's not a problem. Um, all right. Okay. So we can gather the data, but then we need to still figure out is it a landmine or not. Um, at which point you need to currently you need a very very well trained 
person to kind of click through the data, manually try various filters and say, yeah, it's something here, something not. And that's ex it's extremely difficult. It's very non-intuitive if you look at it. So the, you know, we can sit back and dream as a computer science. You say, okay, we have some data and we have some you know, fantastic magic which happens and then tells us, oh, it's a landmine, it's a coke can, or it's a rock, right? That would, that would be like awesome. Um, you know, and we, we could build up this kind of picture. So we have some objects we, we were buried, and we can you know, build up the 3D cube, and we can extract kind of the precise location in 3D space of where, where the mines are. That's kind, of, that, that's kind of the aim. But it's utopia. I mean, anybody who's done any work in, in this kind of area realizes it's utopia. It's something you could try to get to, but it's, it's, <laughs> it has a lot, it's a lot of difficulties. Um, and this brings me into another point. So I, this is just a slide I took from the Drones for Good competition a couple of years ago. And it says, could drones cure disease? And as somebody who's, who's done quite a bit of work in humanitarian space, I mean, this, this, I, there's no, <laughs> I have to think of polite words, but this, re this kind of stuff really annoys me. You know, if technology, people, as technologists, we always like to think technology is great and it's, it's going to solve all our problems and it's going to, you know, there's, there's always a technological solution for stuff. But the real world is a lot more complicated than that, especially in the development context. I mean, something like this, it, it's ridiculous. I mean, drones are not going to I mean, but you see a lot of this. And also, when you talk about landmines, to a, often to a technology audience, you talk about this, people go, oh, great, yeah, we have this wonderful machine learning system. It's going to detect these la landmines, and we're going to save so many, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives or whatever. It, it, it's, a, it's a fantasy, OK? The problems are a lot more complicated than this. Technology is just a small part of the overall solution. And um, so this is just, you know, feet on the ground here. We're not going to win the Nobel Prize. But it does, doesn't mean technology can't be useful. You just have to think about applying it in the right way and, and just be a bit more realistic. Um, but there's a lot of, of this kind of stuff where people get carried away. But anyway, so, OK, we have built some machine learning system. Now, in, this is kind of the ide ideal scenario, right? So this is some real data which was taken in Sweden. Um, we're doing a survey. And there's a big pipe. And you can see this, this big parabola. The horizontal line is the ground plane. So that's actually, you still see that there's a, some bounce back, but also because the transmitter and receiver are so close together, there's actually a signal that jumps straight from transmitter into receiver, and you get this very strong response. But okay, you do get penetration, you can see the big parabola. And you can imagine from a computer vision point of view, you look at that, can you pick out the parabola? Sure, I mean, looks easy, right? The problem is the reality looks more like this. Um, so this was, uh, I think, yeah, a, a, some submunition that, that we buried at a military test site. And uh, this is kind of the real data. And then you can very, very faintly you see a little bump. It's all kind of hazy. But that, that's what the real signature looks like in this case. So that's a lot more tricky. Um, here's another one. So, and here, actually, you don't even see the landmines themselves. But what you do see is disturbances in the top, in the top layer of the soil where we dug the hole to put the landmine in. And then we close the hole again. And the density of the soil where we dug the hole is different than, than the surrounding density. And so that's why you, you know you see this kind of this washed out effect, um, and, you know. And this is only at, this is what like 30 centimeters deep or 40 centimeters, um, definitely not more than that. Um, so it's tricky. And the reason is you've got all kinds of interference going on. Um, so, you know, there's this signal going from transmitter to receiver. Um, there's some of it which goes down to the target and bounces back, but some of it goes up and hits a tree and comes back down. You got interference from cell towers and cell phones and Wi-Fi or whatever. Um, it, it's, it's, really, it's really tricky. You get a noisy picture. Um, and then all of this depends on the weather as well. You know, a survey on a wonderful day like this might be great, but then it rains and you go back tomorrow, you ain't going to see anything because there's all water in the soil and your signal is not getting anywhere and your picture is going to look completely different. So it's a really tricky problem. Um, and then there's the issue you've got lots of manual expertise and you need a lot of time to collect the data. So this is the idea. Could we, could we still, you know, what can we do with machine learning? It's come a long way. There's a lot of very powerful methods. So what, what can we do here? Um, but of course, ideally, we want to do this in a supervised way. Let's not make the problem too hard for, you know, for ourselves initially. So what can we do in, in, super, in a supervised way? We can go out and spend a lot of time digging holes and burying mines. Or we can try to simulate stuff, and which is what we try to do initially. And luckily, there's a, a great tool out there called GPR Max, developed by the University of Edinburgh, which does actually a fairly reasonable job of, of simulating um, different soils and, and different responses. Um, and so you specify your setup, you, you pick a type of mine, you pick a depth, you pick a soil type, and you simulate an antenna moving across the field, and you can get back, um, so yeah, you, solve, you do some physics, and you get back a response. And with that, we can start building up a pipeline. So we define some variation in mines in different soils. 
Um, we generate some input files, we perform the simulation, we, can, we take the simulation output, transform it into an image, um, and then we can do typical machine learning stuff, right? Train validation, apply your classifier, and rinse and repeat. Um, so we've taken an image processing view. You don't necessarily have to do that. You can treat it, you look at the physics and see how the physics work and then try to work backwards from there. Um, both have their uh, merits. Um, but at this point, we thought, do, going the vision way, since there was so much progress on, on uh, in computer vision, and also it's fundamentally it's the way the human approaches the problem as well, um, that's what we try to look at. And so, now in the older version, this is how we, we'd simulate het heterogeneous soil, we'd simulate different types, different patches of different soil, and then we'd run the simulation, we get a picture like this, and you know, we'd stick in a mine, which you can just about see here, and you got a bit of a response there. Okay, and that, that kind of seemed to work. Oh, and yes, uh, you know, for deaf people, this, is, this was all implemented essentially in, in, in your standard Python toolchain. And as for machine learning, well, ConfNets are all the raised these days. They, they perform very well. So, okay, let's, let's pick a fairly standard ConfNet ar architecture, you know, rec rectified linear units. Um, I think there's four layers, four convolutional layers and some pooling. Nothing particularly fancy. Um, we just picked something not too big, not too complicated, and just see where it, where it gets us. And then we can think about how do we improve the model afterwards. Um, and then we built up some data sets. So, you know, starting with the very easy case, landmine, yes mine, no mine. And, you know, you see the parabola and no parabola. And can we at least, let's not worry where the mine is, can we at least tell the difference between the two? And so you push it through your confident and actually you, you get like 99% accuracy or something, something ridiculous, really, really high. And then, you know, you up the difficulty, you introduce some noise, et cetera. And actually still we were getting really, really high accuracies. You look at the filters, and yeah, you know, you, you're picking up these kind of parabolic type shapes and that kind of makes it, net seems to be learning something. Okay, and then you say, well, could we, you know, again, very simple, let's, can we see if we can localize the mine? Um, and in this case, uh, we just use a sliding, sliding window, but you could do something like overfeet and, and, and uh, do it more efficiently. But again, essentially a sliding window approach and you can kind of pick up, pick up where the line mine is. Okay, so this was actually, quite encouraging, even on the, the harder data sets with more noise, it seemed, to, it seemed to be working ridiculously well, which was very suspicious. And then we thought, well, hang on, actually, we started looking a bit closer, and there seemed to be some weird bug going on. And we thought, well, you know, you got that, 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 um, that strong line across the top, which is the reflection from receiver into transmitter. And actually, that's a very strong signal, which was masking a lot was going in there, and the, the way the normalization worked was actually throwing away a lot of the noise. Uh, and so that wasn't good. <laughs> so okay, we fixed that, and then suddenly the picture started looking like that, which was a lot more challenging. But actually, even there, um, we were still getting accuracies around 70, 80%, which was higher than I anticipated. But in the meantime, GPR uh, Max itself improved, and we were able to go from something like that to something like this, where here you could actually specify different soil properties in a kind of mixture model type way, and so we could get much more realistic conditions. Um, and yeah, there was a paper on how to implement that, but. That's less important. Um, but essentially, we generated a, a new data set, which was much more realistic, made much more sense. And again, we could um, we push it through the, the confidence. But even then, we were still getting really, really good accuracies, like 90% easily, and with, with a fairly simple net without doing much effort. So again, that was really that was encouraging, but still very suspicious. Um, and these are just you know two examples of uh, where um, we got it wrong and got it right. Um, and again, we improved the localization side of things. And, uh, okay, seemed to work reasonably. You would make some mistakes, but you know, it seemed to work well for the for, for the, the strong cases. Um, and so, in parallel, we started doing more manual testing as well. So we improved the drone. The radar was improved, and and again, we started to doing some more consistent field trials. So going out to the field, digging holes, burying stuff, flying over it, looking at the data, etc. And so in this case, one case, for example, we buried a whole bunch of random metal things from d different shapes and sizes and different depths. And then, you know, so in this case, put them on a diagonal at different depths, and then you fly over them and collect the data. And then if you do the stitching process where you stitch all the scans together in the cube and you look top down, um, you can, does this have a laser pointer? No. No, okay, well. Um, and you look top down, and then, and this is, you know, you can kind of see there's on the diagonal, you see these red blobs which, you know, illustrate the, uh, the objects we buried. However, 
Um, of course, if you know what the answer is, you can kind of say, oh, well, yeah, you know, it, lo it looks really good. But if, actually, if you don't know what the answer is, it's still not quite obvious how many objects are really buried there uh, and which ones are just noise. Um, so, so, you know, it's, you know, while this actually may look reasonably well if you know the answer, even still, it's actually still a, a pretty, pretty dirty picture. But that's already quite, quite good data. So it illustrates really there's, uh, there's a lot going on. And also, eventually, what we want to do is instead of working in 2D, you'd work in 3D and try to, you know, capture the actual 3D geometry of the landmines, and hopefully that make, gives you more information. But anyway, so that's what we, we did. We collected some data, and this was kind of verifying is the thing, um, you know, is the kind of radar itself behaving as we'd expect it to do in a normal workflow. And that actually seemed to work reasonably well. And that, that's kind of the ultimate idea. Then you can geotag these things, and you can kind of create an overlay. And that's kind of from a high-level point of view, the type of user interface you want to offer, offer people. And note that you don't necessarily have to be really, really accurate at predict predicting where a mine is. But it's also already very useful to be able to say, look, actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's nothing there. Um, that in itself is an interesting, uh, is a useful result. Um, yeah. So, OK, now we actually had some real data. We're doing all this work in simulation. And Patrick had been doing a, a fantastic job of building up data sets and, and tweaking the model and, you know, and, and refining the way, making sure what we generate is, is, exact, is as realistic as possible. Um, and uh, we'd compared with uh, one or two papers pu put out by, the, um, uh, by one of the US defense projects um, who'd been doing similar stuff. And their pictures also looked, you know, they were getting very good accuracies. And it all looked like, looked like it worked out. Um, and so these are kind of three instances of some of the real data. And you can just about see the mines marked. But again, it's not obvious. But then we pushed this, pushed this through the model. But the result was a total and utter fail. Um, it did not work at all. It was in, in pretty much all, in all the cases, it predicted with very high confidence, oh, yeah, there's nothing there. It's fine. Um, and so a bit of a post-mortem. Well, obviously, the real data is quite dissimilar. From the simulation data, though, it was a bit quite surprising. We'd expected it to be closer. Um, there is an effect of, of the UAV and potentially some, some source of noise there. But also, it was, you know, as you saw in the earlier slides, you don't always see a nice parabola. Sometimes you don't. You just see like a, a fading out because where the hole's been dug, or you've got other effects going on. Which, as a human, a trained human operator, you kind of learn to pick up on. But as a machine learning model, who, who's kind of essentially expected to see parabolas in various shapes and forms, it, then it falls over. Um, so, but again, it's a starting point. So it was really nice to go through all the whole end-to-end -end system from idea to building the hardware to collecting the data, doing everything in the simulation, refining the method, then applying some real data. And of course, it, it falls over, which is kind of what I expected. But um, the idea is then you, you iterate, right? And you start feeding in some real data with the simulation data. And how you do some good machine learning model that, that combines you know, both sources of information. And so there's a lot of interesting stuff there. And so you know, talking about future work, so this is where you come into you know, more larger data sets, better models. And also, you know, there's a big issue, false positives versus false negatives. Um, you, you know, landmines, you can't treat them equally. Um, if I say, you know, you know I'm 50% accurate, there's a mine there. It were even 80% accurate, and you know, what, what point is good enough? And, and you know, so and there's uh, yeah, there's thinking about the 3D aspect, um, but then there's other things you could do in terms of localization, etc., and, and active learning and integrating um, expertise from a human. You can imagine a human giving feedback, etc. Um, so there's lots, lots of stuff you could do. Um, but in any case, so far it's it's been interesting, and, and um, you know, we're we'll curious to see where the where the project goes. So. That's kind of a first little story. Any particular questions on, on this or comments? Yeah? At what frequency do you have the new, each new image in the, in the um, From memory, I think it's like 140 scans per second. So, um, so think of it as a hun yeah, 140 uh, pulses per second that are going into the ground. Um, so then it depends how fast you fly. If you fast really fly, they're all far apart. If you fly very slowly, they're all very, very close together. Um, and so we're flying at kind of, um, I think it's limited to, a, I think it's two meters per second, so not, not particularly fast. Um, and, th and there's all other issues related to the drone and data transmission. How do you make the scale and battery life and, and, all, and, and all the rest of it, which I haven't touched there, but yeah. OK, 
And can you do real-time processing? Um, I'm sure event, well, you'd always want to collect a patch of data and, and look at, you, you need some context. Um, you, I'm, I'm, I'm sure eventually if you had good enough algorithms and you'd be smart enough, you could, but yes. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is favor because if you're somewhere hovering uh, above something that yeah. is, looks kind of suspicious, you want to spend more time there and maybe yeah. look at it from different angles and stuff yeah, like exactly. that, which gives you more data points where it's, where it's interesting yeah. rather than looking for hours at stuff yeah. that obviously no, doesn't have anything. That's, that's the kind of thing you do. Currently, we're still in the process of, let's, does this actually work sensibly? And if we can get that to work in the basis case, how do we make it efficient? Um, but again, there's all kinds of issues with the drone itself, endurance. You know, copter can only fly for 15, 20 minutes, which itself raises issues. And um, yeah, sorry, just uh, something you said about the field test. You said you dig the hole, put something in it, and put it back. And you say you can see the disturbance in, uh, yeah. in the soil, so maybe it's also a um, problem in the approach. I mean, you can't, you can't yes. really confirm uh, by, by something. No, I think in indeed. And mm. so, of course, we tested different conditions and you try to compress the soil, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but other than going to a real minefield where things... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then there's still cases where... Um, you know, there are cases where these things have been laid down recently and you can look at soil disturbances. And people typically use thermal methods often for that because the soil cools uh, faster or slower. Um, but yeah, no, that, that's definitely a compound. Yeah. Can, you, can you get more data by looking at angles or is the Brewster angle too sharp and it doesn't work? What do you mean by angles? Can I so look I from mean, here and look from here and look from here and so I get multiple perspectives on the same bit of ground? Um, I'm not sure if it makes sense sense because it's not in a way you're already getting different angles because the way GPR works, you're sending out a cone into the ground and as you f f mm. well you would need two drones actually because if you want to look at an angle you need to have a receiver that's uh, you know if you take oh yeah of course yeah Th that's that issue as well you probably you'd lose you, a lot more information I guess on the on the reflectance, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure it would help much, to be honest. But, no, but maybe. Wait, so, yeah. So, so, so my my idea was that you know if I if I'm flying over like this and looking down, then I'm getting um, I'm getting this solid space of lines like this, mm. and if I'm looking back then I'm getting a space with solids like this. And I'm not worried about bouncing things this way. I'm worried about bouncing things that way. Um, I'm not too sure it's that easy. Um, Probably not. <laughs> um, there's, yeah. OK, I'll, um, I'll drop it. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. Because also, you actually, it's not kind of, you know, it's not a single line that's going. You're illuminating, actually, a sort of kind of, you know, um, kind of like an ellipse on the ground. And all that information, that whole ellipse is being condensed essentially into one point and that's the reading you're getting. I think things get complicated, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, two, two things, one is Dirk has more things to say, so oh, we yeah. can ask more questions later. The <laughs> other is for the shy, you can ask your question in French if you are feeling <laughs> more comfortable with that. Though the questions in English have been very well phrased so far. Yeah. Right, yeah, uh, indeed time. So anyway, that, that's kind of, one project I worked on, which I thought was quite fun and interesting. And we'll, we'll see where it goes. There's still a, you know, a big jump to actually getting this in the field day to day, but th this, it was definitely an interesting project, lots we learned. And often people ask me, oh, what about a metal detector? And uh, actually, I could have included a video. This was, initially I thought there's no way you could put a metal detector on a drone and fly it, just because the sheer proximity you have to be on the ground and the interference with the motors. But actually, um, well, maybe not particularly practical, it, we did prove the concept by having a drone and a coil and the drone flies up and the coil lowers onto the ground and you can fly around with this coil and, you know, it takes good piloting skills but with an automatic height control system and if you, you know, if your uh, terrain is fairly flat, it does work. I wouldn't, it's not particularly practical but it, well, that was uh, something fun as well. Anyway, I guess in, in the UK everybody would know what this picture is about. <laughs> But since we're in France, probably nobody really... Does anybody just mean anything to people? No, of course, yeah. Huh? Yeah, Monty Python. So anyway, it's kind of... And now for something completely different. Yeah, anyway. Who is this? What do you... Huh? Wally, what do you call him in French? Charlie. 
Charlie. Ah, okay, so everybody knows the game, right? Right, so where's Wally? Okay, we could sit here for a while, but anyway, w Wally's somewhere there. Um, so fun little uh, something to keep you entertained. Um, I had a similar problem, which was uh, where's the orangutan? Anybody see? Okay, well, actually, there isn't an orangutan in here. But it's, it's a good exercise. But anyway, so this is a project I, I did, well, I'm still actively involved in with International Animal Rescue. Um, so they're a large animal rescue charity. They um, work in a number of different countries uh, across a range of different species, anything from, you know, from seagulls, maybe not seagulls, um, but from otters to whales to, and they do a lot of work with orangutans. And so they have a couple of centers in, in Indonesia, one on the Java and uh, I think even two in Borneo. And so, so they're an animal rescue center, um, uh, an orangutan rescue center. That's the one they have in, in Borneo. And so this is where, you know, orangutans are an endangered species, but there's babies. They look very cuddly and they're very smart and they're, uh, they're very intelligent. And people like keeping them as pets, uh, which is not a good idea. And often they, they get abused uh, as pets or they get chained, you know, to, to a cage for, for 10 years or whatever. And these animals typically go through very traumatic experiences. Or likewise, um, you've got a large palm oil, oil plant, uh, palm, palm oil business in Indonesia who are chopping down a lot of rainforest, uh, which means orangutans are lo losing habitat. Often they end up in palm oil plantations, completely lost, etc. So a charity like IAR will take them in and try to rehabilitate them and, and patch them up and, and you know, try to get them back into the shape they can release, be released back into the wild. And for some animals this works, but for some other animals they're either too old, too young, too traumatized, or whatever, and they can't release them back into the wild and they just stay in captivity. But of course the idea is to release back as many animals as they can. And so this then leads to the problem, okay fine, you have an animal, you've you spent a lot of time and a lot of money trying to get this animal back into a healthy shape and it's astonishing how much effort and, and resources go into this. Um, and then you release it back in the wild, but of course you want to know that the animal survives for two, two weeks, six months, six years. How, how do you know it's still alive after six months? How do you know it doesn't die after three weeks? And so that's the post-release monitoring phase. So how do you monitor the health and the well-being of a released orangutan after it's, um, well, once it's been released? And this is actually quite intensive. Um, they do this uh, pretty much daily. They check on, up on the animal for the first few months, and then this tapers off over you know, over the years, uh, covering roughly two to three years. They follow each animal to see how it's doing. And if it's declining very rapidly, they'll take it back in and, and, and uh, iterate. But obviously, this is very human intensive um, to track their movement. And you don't really appreciate that until you're there in Borneo, up to here in the mud, mosquitoes around your head, trying to figure out where the damn animal is. It's, <laughs> it's very, um, it's, it's quite intense. And also, once you've, you know, you can follow these animals day by day, which is what they do, you know, almost 24-7 following an animal through the jungle. Uh, but then, you know, you haven't seen it for a week. Where is it? Where do you start looking? You know, <laughs> it's, it's challenging. So what tool do they have? And they only have this since a number of years, actually, is they have some small VHF transmitter implants. They're about, you know, about this big. I should have brought some, actually. And they're implanted at the back of the neck where the animal has a fatty patch. And what these implants do is they send out a pulse a keyed pulse, so just an on-off pulse. There's no uh, modulation or no data encoding or anything. It's just simply on-off um, every one and a half seconds. And every animal has a different frequency, right? So they get these implanted and the animals get released. And then you have um, the people on the ground can pick up the signal of the animal with the large Yagi antenna. Okay, great, you think that, that helps things. You don't have to keep you know, an eyeball on it the whole time. But even still, the range of that antenna in the jungle is on the order of 200, 300, 200 meters, let's say. So that still only means like a you know, 200 meter bubble. And all you get is like a beep. And then, so the way it works is hopefully you're within that 200 meter range. And then you, you, know, you, you hold the thing up and then you point differently. You listen, where does the beep get stronger? OK, it seems to be there. And you walk 20 meters that way. And then, oh, shit, I don't hear it anymore. It seems to come from there. And people wander around the bush trying to figure out where the animals are. And again, so this is an improvement. It's still extremely time intensive. And that's fine if you have two, three, four animals, but you have 50 animals, you, you, you know, it just doesn't scale. And so how do you prove to your donors who are putting a lot of money into this thing is actually working? Right, so, you know, the environment is, is pretty, um, pretty dense. Um, so if you 
tracking them on the ground, this is kind of the, the idea what we have to go through. But the idea is, can we do it from the air? Right? And can we fly above the canopy, easily cover a large area, listen for the signals, and just come back and say, look, the animal is there. That's the idea. And again, we don't need a big, expensive manned aircraft to do it. We can do it from a drone, right? So that, that's a, essentially the problem I got on my desk at, at some point. Um, so you sit down and spend lots of, uh, lots of time thinking about this. And again, same kind of thing as with the landmines. So drones will be great. They can kind of take the needle in a haystack problem to a needle in a bale problem. You know, you can cover more area. Um, however, it does not solve the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is these rather crappy transmitter implants. Um, ideally, you'd want something, an implant that has GPS and talks straight to a satellite and you could just monitor from your desk. The problem is how do you get something that's small enough to be implanted and with a battery life that's anywhere near reasonable. Uh, but then you can say, well, why are we implanting? Why not a collar? And this is interesting. So uh, especially the males, they have these cheek pads. Um, and so a collar would interfere with their cheek pads and their behavior. So no, it's not going to happen. And also, they don't particularly have necks. So it would be fairly easy for them to slide it over. So then you think, OK, maybe like a, a wristband or something around the ankle. But again, they're so flexible, they just slide it right off. Um, you could try to stick something on their back. But again, they're very clever. They're very strong. So that soon, they'll start biting and pulling and they'll, some, you know, it's, very, it's, it's not impossible, but it's very non-obvious how you would attach some kind of transmitter to an orangutan externally um, with a decent battery life and a decent reception, and it's not too heavy, and the animal will gain weight, it'll lose weight, and how do you do it? It's, it's very non-obvious. But anyway, so that, that's really the fundamental problem, and the drones are not going to solve that. Um, so, you know, and they're not going to save orangutans from con con um, extinction. This is... I, I did a talk at some place, and the, and the lady publicizing the talk with the headline, you know, drones saving orangutans for, you know, they're not. They're not. But again, given the, the use case we're dealing with, um, it's a useful tool that can solve a particular need. Um, it's not the be-all, end-all, but it's a useful tool. Again, putting technology in context. Um, and the core problem really is habitat destruction. That's what's really the core problem. And the more you read into it, the, uh, the more you realize it's complex, it's, it's social, it's political, it's even religious in certain cases. And it's just very depressing, to be honest. Um, it's, it's really not fun. Anyway, so, right, so we have a drone. So the idea would be, can we, let's start very simple. Let's not make things too complicated. Can we just fly a lawnmower pattern over the, over the jungle and then come back and it, you get some kind of heat map saying, look, there's an animal there, 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 and there. And that's great, right? And then you know where the animal is and you can go find it and check it's okay, etc. Uh, so, put together something, starting from a fairly standard off-the-shelf drone with a Pixhawk autopilot. Does anybody fly or build drones here? Ah, oh, nobody, come on. So fun. Um, so, a fairly standard multi-rotor system, a Pixhawk is a, is a well-known autopilot. The hobby it's used, it's, you can interface with it very easily. It's not particularly expensive. It's a, it's a great system to test with. And then to that, we attach um, up top an SDR, software defined radio. Does that mean anything to anybody? Software defined radio? Yes, so one person. But anyway, it's essentially you're listening for a radio signal. You need to pick up a radio signal with an antenna. So we got the transmitters here, and we got an antenna, in this case, a loop. Um, and so you, you're receiving this analog signal, which you want to turn into digital samples. And that's what the SDR does for you it takes the analog signal and samples it and gives you a stream of digital numbers, a matrix, essentially. And that's what we want, because then we can start looking at that matrix of numbers and, and do some detection on it. Oh. Um, and then we have a little embedded computer. And this is an Odroid, um, fairly powerful thing for the, the small um, form factor. Um, there's eight ARM cores in there. And we, we just run Python. And uh, we have a little front end. And, oh yeah, so in terms of technology, so you've got drone kit, lovely Python library for interfacing with the drone. You can do a lot of cool stuff. Um, in this case, Pi RTLS, which is a library for the SDR. And we got on the, pro, you know, on the back end, we're doing processing NumPy, Matplotlib, and, and the, the usual suspects. Now, anybody who's done anything with radio will probably realize, actually, this seems a lot of overkill. We're carrying around this big Linux box, essentially, to do a very simple pulse detection. And that's true. Um, but actually, the more you dig into it, it turns out this is actually not a completely stupid idea. Um, but also, it means I'm not a radio person. I could, you know, it would take me three times as long to, to build a PCB and do something that's highly efficient and small, but I wouldn't solve the problem in any meaningful time. So this seemed like a good approach, and actually it turned out to work quite well. And then on top of that, we serve up a web application using um, React and Leaflet and, 
um, and, and again, the, the usual things you, you would expect. Um, so the detection logic, how does that work? Again, I could go into a lot of depth here, but it's, again, not particularly difficult. You have a stream of samples, um, and then, you know, some digital signal processing. You look at the time domain, and you can look at the frequency domain. Anybody here done DSP or? Okay, one person. Fourier transforms, does that mean anything to anybody? A few people, yeah, okay. Um, the, the pictures will make it more clear, but the idea is, so as you fly, you fly through the air and you collect two seconds worth of data. So you listen for two seconds and then you do the processing and then you decide, did I hear a pulse or didn't I hear a pulse? And you just record that. And then the drone comes back, it lands, and then you run some simple post-processing and then the user will interface with the drone over a Wi-Fi connection on a tablet and pull up the web UI and you can see the map and the results and see where things are. Now, of course, you know, it's, it's not an exact science. There's a bunch of heuristics there. You're never going to be exactly correct. But um, you just need to have one good detection and you, you're sorted. Um, right, and there's various difficulties that while an, an implant will say it pings at 150 megahertz, in reality, it's not exactly 150 megahertz. It kind of, you know, because you know, the transmitter is not exact, the clock's not exact, it'll drift a bit. And even the temperature can have some effect. Um, and also the radio you're using, yeah, that's not exact. You'll, sell it, you'll tell it, listen at 150, it won't get it exactly right. There's some noise in there as well. And, and so there's, it complicates things a bit. Um, but the idea is these, this is the kind of information you get. So at the top we have the spectrum. So we're listening, um, zero is the center frequency. So let's say that's 150 megahertz. And I'm listening in a band which is about 750 hertz either side. So somewhere in there, somewhere in that spectrum, I expect to, to hear the signal. So that's the raw spectrum. So for every frequency, you have a power. Um, and then you can add some, you know, apply some filters on that, and you get out a smooth, um, well, you, you know, you, you can apply some filters and uh, renormalize, et cetera. And you, you, know, you, you get out this curve. And then from here, you can start looking, do I see a pulse or anything? Now here, there's not, ignore this one for the minute. So here, there's not much going on. But this is kind of an example where you do hear something. Um, so here, you can see in the spectrum, there's a, there's a clear bump. And so this is where we've, we've actually detected a pulse. And so this is where we caught something. And so you see there's a very clear peak. And again, it's not too difficult to pick out that peak. Uh, what makes it tricky is we, we don't know in advance where exactly this peak is going to be. It might be here, but it might be there. Um, and this is quite an obvious one, but it's not always that obvious. Um, there's a lot more noise depending how high you are, how fast you're flying, etc. So it complicates things. So that's in the frequency domain, but you can do something similar in the time domain. And I won't go in this into too much detail, but if you see how the Fourier transfer, Fourier transform works, you can do something similar. Um, we know what frequency it's pulsing at, um, so we can artificially generate, we, can, we know what the pulse should look like, because we can mathematically generate exactly the pulse we know we're looking for. And then we have our raw data, and in the time domain, we can just do a cross-correlation of the pulse we know we're supposed to find with, with our raw signal we receive. And you do that cross-correlation, and you can look for high correlations, and again, um, that can then help you to tease out if there was something yes or no. And often that is, and the two are a bit complementary, and then often um, you won't see anything there, but actually you'll pick it up in the time domain. Um, but again, there's, there's issues because the frequency is not always exact, um, so it may drift. You don't know in advance where it is, so you have to do some other stuff. And, and so I end up building you know, a Gaussian model of where I think uh, the pulse is going to be with some uncertainties, and you can move things around. But anyway, that, I don't want to go to too much depth for that. It's kind of the intuition. So that's happening while the drone is in the air. Every two seconds, collect some data, do some analysis in the frequency domain, something in a time domain, and just essentially write the results down to a CSV file with the lat-long coordinates of where the drone is, which way it's pointing, et cetera. Um, oh, yeah, and you can, what I'd really want to do is uh, build out a proper Bayesian model of this. And because you've got, you know, you've got different variables. You've got the location, but you've also got the signal strength, um, and you've got the frequency. And you, you could tie this into the re a really nice Bayesian model and do some inference. And it would be a great exercise, but I hope I get the time to go into that. But you could, something simple, you could look at odds ratios and, and the samples, et cetera. But I won't, won't go into detail. But so the, Fine, you know, this is all the coding. And then the very first test is to make sure this worked. We took an Inspire, which is an off-the-shelf drone, and we just strapped the big, a big antenna to it with the one they use in the jungle. 
and we just hovered it above the transmitter and flew around a bit. Um, just to see, does this work at all, or is the interference from the drone going to kill it? And turns out, well, actually, yeah, you can kind of do a heat map, and okay, it seemed to be roughly in the right places, and okay, proof of concept seemed to work. And then I spent a l last winter a lot of my time with my knees in the mud, um, in the freezing cold, with the drone, and hiding the transmitter somewhere, and they're just doing lots and lots of flights. Um, oh, yeah, and this is short. Sure, So yeah, that was uh, the base system I was using. There's a small stick antenna taped to the bottom. Um, this was my ground control station. <laughs> and I spent a lot of time like this. And you do an autom autonomous takeoff. I'll just skip forward. And we fly to a certain altitude. You can just about see the, the drone there in the corner. And I would just start simple. Start at 10 meters, and I do a lawnmower. I see what can I detect. And I say, OK, and I go to 20 meters, 30, 40, 50. Etc. Uh, so I started at 10, I think uh, went all the way up to, yeah, all the way to 120 meters, uh, which is the legal limit in the UK. And actually turned out even, at, well, okay, it's a bit dark, but even at that height, I was still getting, getting um, signals. Now, of course, this is with the, the transmitter just lying there. There's no jungle in between me. Um, which is, of course, a big difference. But again, start simple and, and test the principles. And then you come into land. So the whole thing is, is automated, which is nice. And then you run the post-processing. Um, oh, yeah. And, and the kind of pictures we get is this. Um, so this was taken at 20, 25 meters. And so this is essentially latitude, longitude. Uh, ignore the different plots, but look at just the top row. And the star is where the transmitter actually was. And then the, the red triangles are th where I detected something, where I think I detected something. And it turned out to work quite well that, you know, obviously the star is in this big red region, so that was, means it was relatively accurate to where, where the thing actually was. Um, but it took a lot of iterations, a lot of flights, a lot of playing with different antennas to try and, you know, iterate towards that. And that, that seemed to work out reasonably up to, you know, even up to about, uh, I don't know what this is, uh, 120 meters. So in this case, I only had one detection. Um, well, actually, two, and it you know, seemed to work out quite well. So then we took it to Borneo, and uh, we went to first the, the, the site of the sanctuary itself, where they had a pre-release site, where they take the animals, and just a, it's a fairly small enclosed island, where they let the animals go just to see how they behave in this kind of mock, mock environment. Uh, and somebody else on the team had a DJI Inspire, so while I was doing the the actual tests, he, you know, we had a follow drone which was filming, which was really quite fun and quite cool. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, it's very dark, but so yeah, so I would again pick a height, I think it was around 50 meters, and a patch of forest, and you would fly up and down, up and down, up and down, and come back to land. Um, and uh, first thing I learned that uh, you, op you <laughs> operate in the tropics, and you operate in any kind of real world scenario, things break. Um, things break a lot. Uh, and it's just mo like with the GPR thing. As soon as you move out of simulation into the real world, it's a completely different ballgame. And there's actually these days, um, and I'm, I'm always very, very weary of anything that happens only in simulation. It's a completely different ballgame. Right. And so, Again, we can do the same kind of thing. We flew over the island, or a particular animal we're looking for, we got a very strong signal, which was really nice. And we could start getting plots like this. And it was only at this point, so, you know, in this case, we didn't know the true location of the animal. We just knew it was somewhere in the area. Uh, and actually, we couldn't have wished for better results than this on the, on the first flight. So it was a very obvious hotspot. And so I, you know, I would do the flight, I would show it to the, the, the person manager at the site, they would radio to the guy following the animal. They say, where, do you, where is the animal? They would say, oh, it's here or there. And it, 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 it uh, corresponded really well. And so that was, that was a real milestone, because at that point, the sanctuary actually started to believe, oh, hey, oh, actually, this thing could actually work. And so that was a really nice feeling. But of course, this was on a mock. Oh, yeah. And then you know, there's a web interface I built to kind of sit on top of that. And you could look at the raw data, and you can you know, kind of Google mappy type interface. You, you could see the markers. And you could you know, start the tracking and, and do various things. 
So then it was time to test it in earnest, so we went uh, into the jungle, which <laughs> took quite a while. And then we started tracking, uh, flying from the release site, which is, which is here. And this was the only spot we found which was where we could take off. As you can see, it's quite tight. Um, so this is an autonomous takeoff where we're going to about 100 meters. Uh, the animal is about two kilometers away. Um, so we're flying up to 100 meters, then we dash out two kilometers, and then we do a search, and then we come back and land. Now, I had three telemetry systems, three systems I could use for knowing where the drone was at all times. All three failed, all for different reasons. It was, so here we're flying completely blind. It was kind of let the drone go, and you see it fly off, and you know you <laughs> kind of hope it comes back. Uh, and so here we pick the right angle, and then it, you know, it kind of flies off. Um, so then we'll fly away again for about 15 minutes. And then in this case, we were really happy around 15 minutes I could see it. And then I had to take it down manually. Um, and this was quite nerve-wracking because um, it's quite hard. You see the thing quite high up and you kind of have, there's a bit of wind and you kind of bring it back in, uh, bring it back down. And this is actually the antenna and this is a, a little receiver. Uh, so this is a square antenna stuck to the bottom of the drone. And so this was a, a really nice moment when the drone was back, like, wow, we did the whole thing. So <laughs> then we all gathered behind the, uh, behind the laptop and looked at the results and no detections. Oh, crap, but it turned out the animal had moved. And so, okay, fine. And, you know, uh, we had videoed the whole thing, as, as you can see. So we could kind of, because there was a hill in between, so we had to we judge the altitude. Well, we can fly a bit lower and, you know, we get better sensitivity. And so we did that, and we then sent the drone off again, and it took off, and it flew away. And uh, then we waited, waited, and then 15 minutes, I could, I could see that on the transmitter, it reconnected, so I knew it was within a kilometer. Um, and then suddenly the signal went, and we waited, and we waited, and then it didn't, it didn't come back. And then a post-mortem showed that, you know, we lowered the height slightly, on the way back, roughly about a kilometer away, there's a big hill with some tall trees and probably just hit the top of the tree and stanked into it. And so, so the drone is out there stuck in, in, stuck in the tree somewhere, um, which was a shame, but we were quite, you know, it, it was not unrealistic to expect it to happen. Um, so that was interesting. And so that was round one, um, the drone concept proven. Um, lessons, if it can break, it will break. Um, and if you did not, you know, test that change, it probably will have broken something. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, and you, what you also see is robustness above everything, you know, you, much more so than efficiency. Anyway, so I'm now working on a, on a, on a version two, aiming to test maybe in a f hopefully January, February of next year to take back, so it'll be a better drone. Um, I've switched to a different computer um, and, and different detection logic, et cetera. Um, and actually, this you know, this is kind of fairly open project. If there's people who are interested in this kind of stuff, um, I'm happy to talk. And there's also some interesting data from how these animals move around the forest and how they forage and which ones are successful in release or not. Which, from a data scientist point of view, is also very interesting. And I gave a talk in London about this uh, a while ago. And uh, actually, since then, there were two people who came on board and we, they got some data and they're kind of exploring it. It was really good fun. Um, and just maybe as a moral story, there's some. What, what somebody told me, which I always remember, who's working with one of these sanctuaries, and uh, his, you know, actually, if you look into this and you, you realize, you know, about the habitat destruction, the way things work, etc., it is quite depressing. And the way this guy described it, he'd been doing this for 30 years, he essentially said, well, conservation is creating hope where there is none, which is quite depressing, but essentially that's, that's you know, in many ways the truth, which I think is, is interesting to remember. Anyway. I'm almost out of time. I have one more section, but that's, I've kept that fairly short since. Um, but again, it's something completely different. Uh, I don't know if there's any particular questions on this end before we switch over, or otherwise we can talk about it afterwards. OK. Yeah. Right, so radar and drones here, still drones, but not landmines, but orangutans, different set of problems. Um, we got some computer vision, machine learning, and signal processing. Um, again, in, lots of interesting things, lots of stuff I had to learn, and still need to get my head around, but it, it's, it's always rewarding. You can build something, it actually works. But anyway, so what I do in my day job is, 
is again something very different. And again, so I'm, I stress I'm not, I'm not wearing my Oxbotica hat, but this is kind of just to give an idea. So what we do is mobile autonomy. So you have a vehicle and you want it to be able to navigate the world autonomously. Um, the classical example that everybody thinks of is like Uber and their autonomous taxis, for example. But there's a lot more other, other um, domains. So our focus is on the software stack and building up all the algorithms and, and, and the control and the, the perception, et cetera, um, to do this and that we license out to other companies to use. They might license the whole thing or they might license small parts of it. Um, so we're really a software company, but of course we need to demonstrate stuff working on real vehicles. Um, and so this is, for example, a car we custom built that we just use for testing and, and research per and demo purposes. So if we have a new algorithm or we, we, we change a detector or something, we deploy it in the car and we start doing some routes and we, we test how it behaves. And so when I first arrived at Oxbotic, my first two months were essentially building that thing, literally from soldering wires and, and, power and harnesses um, all the way up to installing the software and tuning the, the, um, the algorithms. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the classical uh, headshot. Uh, and there's, yeah, there's lots of fun testing, especially obstacle avoidance ones where, okay, you first test it with a cone, it seems to work, and then it's kind of, okay, we put a human there, and then you're standing there, and you see the car coming, and you think, okay, is it going to stop? <laughs> it's going to stop? It's going to stop. Oh, shit, is it going to sh Shit, it's not going to stop. <laughs> and so this is a problem, you know, well, there were occasions where, you know, we were still tuning things, and the problem was it was, it was, you know, it saw you, and it was avoiding you, it's just not in a very human-like manner. Um, but, you know, as a human, you're standing there, you think, oh my god, it hasn't seen me. And just the moment you're going to jump aside, it, you know, it avoids you. Um, and then there's debate whether you want to avoid or should you just stop. And, you know, there's lots of choices to be made. Anyway, but, you know, there's lots of different applications. We now have this running quite a few different vehicles. Um, there's been some work on rail, uh, um, off-road, uh, forklifts, and uh, low-level um, autonomous transport. Actually, also some of the core vision algorithms are going on the uh, ExoMars mission. Um, so that's all how do you localize based on just a camera. So all you have is a camera. How do you, you know, track where you are based on that? Um, again, you know, there's, there's all this, this work builds off uh, years and years of research at the University of Oxford, which I cannot even begin to, to dip into. But kind of the high level theme, which I think makes the Oxford approach somewhat different, is it's all about experience based um, navigation autonomy. So the idea being, so this is the, exactly the same scene traversed in different conditions. So we got in the snow, we got at night, and we got during the day. And things look very different. And so if you're localizing based just on a camera, um, this is extremely difficult because you, you can look for corners or, or, point or features or things, but things look very different in different scenes. So how, how do you deal with that? Do you try to build one big model of the whole world in all possible conditions, or, or do you try to do something else? And Again, there's, there's not enough time to go in detail, but the philosophy is uh, we want kind of local excellence over global mediocrity. So we want to be very good in specific places, areas, um, and we prefer that on trying to be average everywhere. So we want, maybe want to be very good at driving in Nantes, for example, um, versus, and maybe a bit less so in Paris or whatever, instead of trying to build one system that, that kind of does on average everywhere. Um, and the idea behind this is, again, to have, we think of multiple experiences. So Every time the vehicle goes through a scene, it builds up a memory of what that scene looks like. And so in this case, and you can have multiple memories and different mem and so there's a whole lot of logic, you know, when do you create a new memory, etc. But the idea is, so this is as we're running live, I think this is actually a guy on his bike with the camera on the front. So as he's cycling through, um, you're matching certain features and landmarks in, the, in your live image to what you have in memory. And you may have different memories of the same route and actually, if you come to a complex intersection or things that will change a lot, or, you know, for example, trees that lose their leaves in winter or things that change a lot with the environment, you'll notice you'll, have, you'll need more memories to kind of localize in that specific place because it can look a lot more different in different situations. So that's kind of the intuition. And, you, and this, the same concept works in different environments. So this is kind of, you know, city, urban city environment to a warehouse. Um, so this is in Chile, uh, the Atacama Desert, which is mimicking a Martian landscape. Um, and that is, just, uh, I think, just an off-roading um, environment. And then what you see is that you know areas which are tr areas which are fairly don't change much over time. Um, you don't need m many memories to kind of 
localize against them. But areas that do change a lot, you need more memories. And by having this dynamically change over where you go, you, you can get better performance. And that's really a, a core strength of the Oxford group. And that's really the localization side, so where, how do I decide where I am? And then there's all kinds of other work, and these are just simple examples. Uh, this is some recent work that was done um, in terms of if you're detecting obstacles, like in this case with a laser, so you've got a spinning laser, and those are your obstacles, and you notice the black areas behind it, so your laser can't see through people, so you don't actually know what's behind the person. Um, but actually, as these you know, people are moving and cars are moving, um, you can push this through a big recurrent net, and actually you can, you can predict um, how people are going to move if you can't see them. You know, so if I'm looking at you walking the street and there's a car that comes in front of me, in front of me I can't see what you're doing, right? So I have to wait till the car passes and then I, the laser catches you again. But you can actually start using a net to kind of predict what the path of that person could be. Um, so that's some interesting things. Um, there's also, um, this is some, again, also something more recent is uh, doing road segmentation. So what is drivable? Where am I allowed to drive? Uh, again, for as a human, it's fairly intuitive, but again, for a machine, it's, it's pretty non-trivial. Non uh, and again, this is using a fully convolutional net to do image segmentation, where you're taking all the pixels um, and essentially assigning a label to each of the pixels. Is it road? Is it an obstacle? Um, and, and what is drivable? So this is drivable, um, and the red is obstacles, essentially. Um, and because you're doing this on a car, you've got, you got, um, you got some extra information you can use. You know the car is on the ground, right? And you know obstacles are not going to be floating in the sky. Um, and so there's, all, there's bits of prior information you can use to generate data. Uh, and in particular, for this kind, if you want to train a classifier on this, um, all you actually have to do is drive a route, and then you know the car has driven that route, so you know by definition that's drivable. So that can generate you labels, and then you can train a classifier on top of that. So if you want to generate training data, all you have to do is drive. So you can generate as much data as you want. And then you can, you can push it through a classifier, and then you can, you can get something out of it. And then interestingly, if you start applying this classifier where you drive, it starts picking up on, on these kind of things where it actually detects there's, there's more than one option you can drive, which is interesting. And the, the full paper of this is online. Um, yeah, and this is just the, the very last slide I had. Uh, which is just kind of rolling video of various machine learning type stuff that we do, most of it fairly standard. Um, you know, anything from um, pedestrian detection in 2D and 3D um, to cars to um, analyzing point clouds, etc. cetera. Um, so I'll just leave this rolling in the background, but um, I think I'll end it there. So I'll just try to give, from an applications perspective, three different things I'm involved in, three quite different things, just to give you kind of flavor what, what else is out there at a fairly high level, but yeah, I'll end it there. Do you have questions? Même en français. Bonsoir. Uh, je parler en français. Pour la segmentation, là, j'ai vu les différentes couleurs. Mmh. Euh, Est-ce que vous différenciez les objets mobiles des objets immobiles, de sorte à ne pas encombrer la mémoire des objets qui sont mobiles um, So, am I right Sorry, I can't answer in French, but... So, if, am I right, you mean... So, in the road segmentation, with the three colors, the blue, green, and red, are we making a difference between stuff that moves versus stuff that's stable? Um, actually, yeah, if you run this, you, you'll notice... Um, because it's based off laser data as well. So you have the, um, you know what's drivable, you have the camera which captures the raw images, but you also have lasers which tell you where the obstacles are and you're training the net on, on that information. Um, and yes, if you actually play it like a, a car that's moving, it will detect that as an obstacle and, and won't, uh, won't try to drive over it. So yeah, that's, but then the, the network learns this implicitly. It's not something we tell it to. Um, so the short answer is yes. Et, et quand tu enregistres, euh, quand tu enregistres, quand tu fais ton expérience, ton, mm -hmm. tu fais ta mémoire, tu enlèves ces objets qui se déplacent. Ah, ok, yes. Yeah. So the experiences, yeah, of course, you filter out moving stuff um, because otherwise, you know, if you kind of, as part, so if you're, you're building a map in a way, so is, if you're incorporating in your map map stuff that moves, 
you're not going to have a very good map because the next time you go there, that person or that cyclist won't be there anymore. Um, so yes, a part of that process is also figuring out you know, what moves, what doesn't move, and filtering that stuff out. Now, of course, if there's one guy who stands perfectly still and doesn't move and you drive through, um, you, know, you might pick that in. But you have enough features to make yourself robust. But yeah, that's, that's a concern. Yeah, oh, so this is similar kind of thing, but a completely different approach. This is using just a single camera and doing dense reconstruction to also figure out what's drivable and not. So it's not really a machine learning based thing. Um, anyway. For, for those of you who haven't followed it, the approach at Oxbotica is very different from Google's, for example, where Google is using their massive map database to figure out where they can drive. And there have been some amusing, I mean, they're, they're very reliable, but there have been some amusing errors where their map is inaccurate, and so the car thinks that maybe you can drive somewhere where actually maybe it's just a map error. Um, but that, that said, their, their safety record is astonishingly good. Mm. Uh, if we look back from the first the DARPA challenge to today, I mean, as Jeff just said, I mean, we are now almost, uh, almost out there <laughs> with, with, in, in the real world with cars that arrive themselves, so uh, a long way. Uh, can you, I mean, I don't know much about it, can you tell us um, a little bit about what's really important in there? I mean, are the maps <coughs> important, the cameras, is, is it, uh, what is it? <coughs> So that, that's a very good, well, <coughs> that's a good question, but also a very big question. And also, <coughs> I'm not sure I'm really the best person to answer that in a, in a sensible way. My gut feeling would, to, would be to say everything's important. Um, one thing, so a video I sometimes show is, did, who saw the DARPA robotics challenge, or I forget what it's called, um, the one I think last year or two years ago where you had the humanoid robots and they had to climb up ladders and yeah. they had to open doors, etc. The one that Google won. Uh, yeah, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's a lovely video of the fail, the fail version of that where you have sequence after sequence of a, a robot trying to open the door and you see you go and it falls over or another one it's trying to get upstairs and it falls down or all these it's it's really really it's really really funny but actually if you think you know this is cream of the crop right and this is this is uh, you know all top really top notch teams um, and i find in a way that's the thing with robotics and also with ai and this is just me subjectively is that you really have to have all the various elements working together in harmony um, for the whole thing to come, come across and to work very well. If there's small, you know, if, if, if there's a certain segment of your system, so you anything from low level control all the way up to high level planning, if there's something, for example, in the control layer that doesn't work very well, that introduces an error that cascades, the whole thing can fall to parts and it looks really bad, even though actually the error maybe have been quite small and you could argue, okay, that's more of an issue with robustness and you designed better systems. But so, I think that there's that element that every, every part of the system is really important to get it right and understanding how does uncertainty propagate through that. Um, so that's one thing. But otherwise, what's important? Well, it depends on the application you're doing, I guess. Um, if I really want to have a car out there uh, that is self-driving, I mean, yeah. the, the, what, what is the most important thing? Is, is it the planning? Is it the detection? Is it the camera that I kind of knows where it is? Is, is it the mapping behind it? I, I, it's all trade-offs, I guess. Do you... <sighs> You know, if you get in a car and it can, you say, okay, safety is the most important, right? I don't wanna, I wanna make very sure I do not run into people or not kill anybody. But okay, the end result might be a car that comes and as soon as the leaf blows, it hits the brakes. And it goes a pit on and then there's a shadow and oh, it hits the brakes because it might be something. And so you get a very poor, yeah, that's not acceptable, right? Um, so, or likewise planning, you'd say, well, okay, maybe planning is less important, but if you go to the wrong place, so it doesn't realize there's some construction work and it drives into a ditch. Um, I think it depends, there's, there's certain trade-offs you have to make, you cannot be optimal in all cases. And so you have to think, what application am I working on? What's the trade-offs the best for that application? And what are the trade-offs best for the human? As a human driver, what do you want? Um, so I don't know, I don't have a single answer as what is best. I think it depends what you're doing and how do you make that trade-off? More questions? On any of the subjects? So <clears throat> when, you're, um, when you're looking at 
road segmentation or finding whether um, something is a person, um, are you only getting a yes or no answer, or is it something like probabilities of something happening? Or, I mean, it's linked to what we we're discussing right before. Um, if you think something is a person, um, that's more important than if you think it, if it's a tree, for example, because you do not want to run over that person. Um, but I guess it's, I guess my question is like, where do you draw the line on what's acceptable? Again, that's not an easy answer. And also, you know, there's, I'm not wearing my Oxbotica hat here, and there's only, you know, I, I obviously can't go into technical detail how we do everything and make, make, the, make all those fine decisions. Um, so all, all I can really say is that, of course, it matters what's in front of you. Is it a, is it a cyclist? Is it a pedestrian? Is it a dog? Is it a football? Um, those things matter, and you want to behave accordingly. Doing that accurately is not easy. Um, you've got vision, but you've got laser as well, and each have their own issues. So how, you know, there's some interesting work in how do you bring those multiple sensors together. Um, but beyond that, I can't really say much. But yes, it, it, it matters. Um, but things get complicated quickly. And then there's, you know, what, what comes down to what is, what is good enough? And that may depend on the person, and how do you measure what that is, and what probability is acceptable. This then comes down to how do humans behave, and how good are human drivers, and should you just match them? Or it's a whole can of worms there, but yeah. Uh, one more. Um, what is the biggest challenge right now? I mean, when, when we look at these uh, images from movies, I mean, that's, there's a lot of processing going on, and I mean, each problem just detecting pedestrians or, or, or you know, uh, categorizing objects between a ball and a dog, and you know, all these are problems by themselves that are not trivial. We know that. Um, so all of this needs a lot of processing power. Um, is that a real issue today, or are we on top of that? And uh, you know, can you comment a little bit how? How, where are we currently? I mean, if, we, if, you give it, if I give you 100 times more processing power, does that increase uh, the, the security by what? By a factor two or? Again, so I, I, I should, you know, again, caveat, I'm not necessarily the best person for that. And of course, I can only talk about the, roughly my experiences and, and what we can do and what I'm allowed to say about that. I can't speak for, for Google or for, for other companies out there who have, you know, may work differently. Um, and just, Computers are pretty fast these days. GPUs are very fast. Um, uh, if you're doing image processing. Um, so you need GPUs um, I'm trying to, I'm not sure actually for that, the particular, w the road segmentation, I'm not sure if it was done with GPU or not. It might have been. I, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. As, as of but about two years ago, Google's cars had a suitcase size GPU supercomputer in the back. Yeah. Um, but it's amazing what you can do with them. Um, with current hardware. So I think we can already solve some pretty interesting challenges with what we have already. Any more questions? So you'll have a chance to ask more questions informally afterwards. Um, so let's thank Dirk once more. <laughs>